Appreciate that. Let's get into our study now. We kind of restarted the prophecy course last week. Now we're going to go on and, and begin wrapping up our study of Daniel. It'll be a few weeks in, uh, you know, a few weeks of work to do that because we're going to go through ch chapters 10, 11, and 12. 11, we're going to slow down, take some time with that because there's a lot of information there. Uh, but 12 will be like one lesson. And today, I think we're going to finish with Daniel chapter 10 this morning. So open your Bible to Daniel chapter number 10. Amen. Pray for the Campbells who are traveling up north to be with their son, Brandon, and Pastor Campbell. Be with uh, Brother Brock and Emily and, and the family there They're off to Oklahoma. Probably on their way back now, right? Oh, they begin tomorrow the trip back home. And remember to pray for Cardi. She's on their prayer list, but she had some pretty pretty severe tearing in in, uh, in giving birth to Elizabeth, uh, Jane Elizabeth or something like that, Elizabeth Jane or something like that. <laughs> anyway, so be in prayer for her. Uh, she's going to be traveling and uh, pretty uncomfortable. All right. All right, Daniel, chapter number 10. Let's go ahead and read the entire chapter. And uh, so follow along in your Bibles as I read. The Bible says in Daniel chapter number 10, beginning at verse number 1. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. And the thing was true, but the time appointed was long. And he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. <coughs> in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. And in the four and twentieth day of the first month, I was by the side of the great river, which is, is Hidekel. By the way, that's the Tigris. Then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Euphaz. His body also was like the burrow, and his face as the appearance of lightning. And his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet in color like to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell on, upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone, and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me, <coughs> for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption." And I retained no strength. Yet heard I the voice of his words. And when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face and my face toward the ground. And behold, an hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days." And when he had spoken such words unto me, I set my face toward the ground, and I became dumb. And behold, one like the similitude of the sons of men touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spake and said unto him that stood before me, O my Lord, by the vision my sorrows are turned upon me, and I have retained no strength. For how can the servant of this my Lord talk with us, my Lord? As for me, straightway there remained no strength in me, neither is there breath left in me. Then there came again and touched me one like the appearance of a man, and he strengthened me, and said, O man, greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be unto thee. Be strong, yea, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened, and said, Let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I am come unto thee? And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth, and there is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael, your prince. 
The portion of this passage we are particularly interested in is the vision. And that begins at verse number 5. It runs through verse 7. We can pick up verses 8 and 9 also to offer some further clarification. Verse 10 is going to be very important to us as we try to work out uh, who is this? This manifestation, the glorious manifestation with all these tokens of deity uh, that, that are present in this, uh, in, in this vision. So who is it? I think most of us would think, yeah, probably <laughs> it's the same person that John saw on the Isle of Patmos. And that is my conclusion. But there are some problems with that conclusion. So we're going to look at this this morning and try to ascertain who is this person that Daniel sees in this vision. Let's go ahead and get started. Well, you've seen that about at least three times. Maybe a few more. But just to keep it in front of you so you remember that all of these prophecies that Daniel gives throughout his book come off of the vision that God gave to Nebuchadnezzar in a dream. So all these visions are about God's workings among the nations during a period called the times of the Gentiles, when God had passed the kingdom from Israel and gave it to the Gentiles. So that's what all of this is about. Even the prophecy of the 70 weeks <coughs> is about the period of time during which Israel would be without the kingdom, waiting for her king, that kind of thing. So it's all, it's all, sp it's all a spinoff of this dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. And of course, his golden head, Babylon, the upper torso of silver, Persia, the, the brass belly and thighs, Greece, the legs of iron, feet of iron mixed with clay, ten toes of iron and clay, uh, the fourth kingdom, or we call it the mystery kingdom. And of course, during the mystery, during the fourth kingdom, Jesus shows up, takes the kingdoms from Satan into his own power, sets up his church, gives to his church the keys of the kingdom, and that's what's going on right now. When the church is removed, then Daniel's prophecy concerning the little horn and all that will go into fulfillment. <clears throat> Let's take a look again at Daniel's visions when they occurred. His first, uh, well, this starts at 608 B.C. when the kingdom was transferred from Israel to Nebuchadnezzar. And then he has his interpretation, or Daniel, excuse me, offers the interpretation to Nebuchadnezzar's dream in 603 B.C. And then some years later, say, pass now. And we come to 549 B.C., <laughs> where Daniel receives the vision of the four beasts. And then he receives the vision of the 2300 days in 546 B.C., about three years later. And then he receives the prophecy of the 70 weeks in 539 B.C., and that's the year that the kingdom was transferred from Babylon to Medo-Persia or from Babylon to Persia. And then, of course, Alexander, oh, I'm sorry, then he has the vision of chapters 10 to 12 in 537 B.C., a few years after he received the prophecy of the 70 weeks. And that's where we are right now. And then we have uh, the transfer of the kingdom from Persia to Greece occurs in 333 B.C. All right, just to kind of keep you, uh, um, you know, some sense of history here, where we are with all this, Okay. So now Daniel 10 is a continuation. Oh, by the way, you should have received your notes. If you've got the student notes with uh, the blanks, you can fill them in right now. If you've got the teacher's notes, then you don't need to bother with it. Okay, here we go. Daniel 10 is a continuation of the prophecy that Daniel recorded in Daniel chapters 8 and 9. We've uh, spent a lot of time elaborating on that and explaining that. I don't think I need to go into it any further right now than to just remind you and and they offer yet another proof that establishes that. Each of Daniel's prophecies concludes with a vision of Christ. For example, this vision, this dream that Nebuchadnezzar had and that Daniel was given uh, so he could interpret it for Nebuchadnezzar. How does it end? It ends when the rock, the stone cut without hands out of the mountain, comes upon the feet destroys the whole thing, grows into a great mountain, and Jesus Christ is ruling on the earth. It ends with a vision of Jesus Christ coming to the earth. The visions of the four beasts conclude in the same way. Only in this one you have 
a the Ancient of Days shows up. A glorious vision of the Ancient of Days in a throne that's all ablaze. Fiery throne. Imagine that. Uh, the person sitting in this throne is adorned in a garment that's white as snow. His hair is like pure wool. Uh, and he's in that fiery throne with, the f with fire issuing forth from the throne. It's just an amazing picture with thousand thousands ministering to him, attending to him. In other places of scripture, we know that when, when the lightning flashes and the thunder roars and all that kind of stuff, that's the Lord speaking and the angels responding to his, his words. So you could just picture this going on at this throne room. And, uh, and then you have uh, 10,000 times 10,000 who are watching all of this, gathered around the throne and watching all of this. It's fascinating stuff. And then the Son of Man, who is Christ, is escorted to the Ancient of Days. He's brought up to him and he's given a kingdom and power and glory over all languages and people and nations and so on, an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and that shall not be destroyed. So you have this amazing vision of the Son of Man, Christ, receiving the kingdom from the Father at the, that concludes the visions of the four beasts. Okay, So Nebuchadnezzar's dream concludes with Christ coming, a kingdom. The kingdom come. The vision of the four beasts concludes with a manifestation of God in heaven upon his throne handing off the kingdom to his son. All right? But when you go to chapter 8, you don't see anything like that. There's, there, there appears to be no manifestation following the vision recorded in Daniel, in Daniel chapter 8. So you keep reading. And you go through chapter 9. No, in fact, there's no vision in chapter 9 at all. People make that mistake often, but Dan, Daniel 9, it's a prophecy. He's given a prophecy, but he doesn't see any visions. Then you go to chapter 10, and now you come to a vision without any prophecy preceding it. So there's no prophecy preceding this appearance of the Ancient of Days and all that going on. It's just uh, the, it's some stuff going on with the angel showing up and all that kind of stuff, some, some background information. And what and I've already labored on this quite a bit, but you remember that when you go from Daniel 8 to 9, you're continuing the prophecy of Daniel 8. It's also true that when you go from Daniel 9 into chapter 10, there's nothing to break away. I mean, that's all one continuous thing. Now, there's a lot of time that goes past between 8 and 9. A few years between 9 and 10. But... As far as the narrative is concerned, as far as the prophecy is concerned, it's a continuing thing. So Daniel 9 is an answer to a part of the prophecy given in Daniel 8 that wasn't revealed. Remember? You look at Daniel 8, and when it comes to the end, Daniel's saying, nobody got it. I couldn't understand it. Nobody I told about this could understand it. Well, we know he wasn't talking about understanding what the ram represented because we were told what that is. That's Persia. Media, Media and Persia. We know he wasn't talking about what the goat represents. We were told it's Grisha. So that wasn't what it was about. So what part of Daniel 8 did, did Daniel not get? It was that 2300 day business. That removal of the daily sacrifice. That's what was still puzzling to him. Well that's what Daniel 9 is about. Daniel 9 lays out the prophecy, the 70 weeks prophecy that leads to the removal of the daily sacrifice. That's what the 70 weeks prophecy is all about. It's its focus. So Daniel 9 completes the vision of Daniel 10. Uh, Daniel 8, I'm sorry. Now we go to Daniel chapter 10. But, oh, by the way, but we have no vision, no manifestation of Christ. We come to Daniel 10 now, and we get this interesting insight. The prince of Persia was resisting Gabriel from getting to Daniel. <coughs> so suddenly we learn that when it comes to the Daniel 8, 9, and 10 prophecy, 
One reason we, we could offer that explains why it was stretched out the way it was, given in pieces, is because you got the spiritual warfare going on and the Prince of Persia is interfering. I think it's appropriate to, to offer <laughs> that except for the interference of the Prince of Persia, Gabriel would have gone ahead and finished out this whole thing in Daniel 8. Daniel 8 would have been a couple of chapters longer. Daniel 8 would have included. In other words, Daniel would have come to the conclusion there and said, I don't get this thing that's going on with this 2300 days and this, the removal of the day of sacrifice. And as is the pattern's already been set, every time Daniel says, but I don't get it, what about this? The angel says, here's the answer, right? Every time. You come to Daniel 8, it concludes with Daniel going, I don't get it. What's this about? But the angel leaves. Why did he leave? Then he shows up some years later. And when he shows up, he gives him the prophecy of the 70 weeks. And then he leaves again. And then he shows up. And when he shows up the, the third time in this, in this thing, he explains. We've been running interference with some of the devils. So you get this picture that this particular prophecy was something the devil didn't want to get out there. <laughs> Amen. He wanted to stop this. He was fighting and fighting it with everything that he had to keep us from knowing what the program is, what the plan is, how this is going to lay out. So this war is going on, and that's, I, I'm sure, the reason it's broken up into these three chapters. And then chapter 10 you have the manifestation of Christ that bothers the devil the most. It's the Father passing off to the Son the kingdom. Not the kingdom of men. See, that he's talking about, uh, it's, this gets confusing for people. There's, this, there's the kingdom of men and the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of heaven and all that kind of stuff. Well, kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God are interchangeable. They're just, you know, different sides of the same coin. <laughs> and then there's the kingdom of man. The kingdom of man, the dominion, was given to man. Right? Okay. So Satan wants to usurp God's place over that kingdom. Because God was going to be, was, is, God of man. And God over the kingdom and king of the kingdom. But Satan, as you know, tried to take it. Well, he finally got the kingdoms under his power, didn't he? But then Jesus came and took all the kingdoms back under God. But that's not the kingdom we're talking about here. The kingdom we're talking about in Daniel, uh, Daniel 10 is the one Jesus spoke of when he was here and said, I'm going to go and receive a kingdom. That's a different kingdom. So what happened down here is really fascinating because only a man can hold the dominion God gave to man. Only a man can hold it. So what Satan was going to do is he was going to usurp God's place in the world and pick a man through whom he would rule it. Right? We know that's going to happen later on. But God sent Jesus into the world who was God Manifest in flesh. That threw him a curveball. Because now we have God who is man. And so God then, as man, beat the devil and took the kingdoms out of his hands and restored them to man. Brought them back under uh, to man. And yet the man to whom they were given was God. So what happened literally is the kingdom of men got brought into the kingdom of God. That's what happened. The kingdom of man is now within the kingdom of God because God, who rules the kingdom of heaven, is also a man who rules the kingdoms of men. That's why Jesus said that he has all power over heaven and earth. That's what's got the devil in such a fuss. Because now God rules the kingdoms of men. So Jesus set up his church. He gave them the keys of the kingdom. His Holy Spirit in them. 
resisting the spirit of Antichrist out there. And you know that routine. We've been over that often. And that's where we are right now. That's what's going on. But the kingdom we're talking about here is not that kingdom. Jesus came and took the kingdom of men away from Satan, brought them within the kingdom of God, and then he went to heaven to get another kingdom. Another one. And that's the one that's passed to him here in this vision. See? Everybody with me on that? You see what I'm saying? Okay. All right. And this is the vision he receives of Christ, and it's described in our, in our chapter here. Let's talk about the occasion of the vision. In the third year of Cyrus, that's 537 B.C., now, what's happened is the kingdom has been transferred from Babylon to Persia, or to Media Persia. And that's Darius the Mede and Cyrus the Persian. Darius was Cyrus' uncle. And Cyrus married a niece of Darius. So it's kind of all in the family here. And... They combined together to overcome and overpower Astyages, who was the father of Darius. Now, Astyages was a wicked, evil man. He had a general. We think it was Darius. There's speculation here, but we, most of us who study this all out have concluded that more than likely this guy Harpagus was Darius. And he has Darius go on a mission and he didn't do what he was told to do. He was supposed to kill somebody. You've seen stories based on this, where like, like Snow White was supposed to be killed out in the forest by one of the, by the wicked queen's woodsmen. You know, weird stuff like that. This, this story, those stories come from this history, where this general, Astyages, sent, uh, this king, Astyages, sent a general out to kill somebody, and bring back his heart, that kind of thing. He brought back a pig's heart instead of, the, the man's heart, the king discerned this. He figured it out. He learned it. And so he required that king, that general, to eat his own son. Pretty bad. Now, that's how bad this guy was. Well, as anybody can understand, there was a little bit of resentment there. Okay? Yeah, no kidding. And so many people believe, and I, I'm one of them who conclude with this, that this is Darius. And he sided with Cyrus. And they got together and pretending to be on the side of his king, Astyages, he turned his army against Astyages with Cyrus' army, and he overcame Astyages. And that's how Darius became king of the Medes. So king of the Medes, Darius, king of the Persians, Cyrus. Cyrus is the younger of the two, but he's growing in greater power. Persia's a much stronger nation. So Cyrus then is fighting Nabonidus. Nabonidus is the father of Belshazzar. Nabonidus was a general in Nebuchadnezzar's army. He married Kaseya, which is Nebuchadnezzar's daughter, and, and he became the successor to the throne of Babylon through a series of very strange events that we won't, re re won't retell right now. But Nabonidus now sees Cyrus growing in power. He knows that Cyrus got together with Darius, overcame his theogies. He knows this is going on. And he sees Cyrus is a growing power and concern. He takes the army of Babylon north to engage the army of Cyrus. And they're fighting. That's going on for 10 years. We come down to the end of that 10-year period now. Belshazzar, the handwriting on the wall, kingdom transferred, you know, you're, You've been weighed the balances and found wanting, and that's where we are. Then three years later, in the third year of Cyrus, which is 537 B.C., some would, would tell you it's not exactly three years. It could be any, any, any time into the, the, the second year, you know, three years. All right, the, any time after the end of the second year. You, you understand what I'm trying to say? When it says three years, it doesn't mean three full years went by. So it says in the third year, it means you're in the first year and then you're in the second year. And as soon as you walk into the third, it could happen. You get what I'm saying? So it could be two years in one month, two years in one day, that kind of thing. All right. Uh, I get all fixated on detail. Sorry. 
Daniel was in a mourning fast. Daniel 9, verse number 2. What's a mourning fast? If you read, if you read my little book, Kingdom Power by Prayer and Fasting, I talk about the different kinds of fasts. One of them is a fast that you're moved into through a period of mourning. All right? You've lost a child. Some great tragedies happen. Uh, whatever. You, you come under great concern for the country, as I have many times, and in a period of, in a, in a driven by mourning into an extended fast, uh, stuff like that. So it's a mourning fast. Daniel was mourning. Now, why was he mourning? This is a, uh, this is a good time in history. Right? Think about it. Uh, Babylon has fallen. You read Daniel 9, and Daniel's all excited. He read in the books of Jeremiah, and he knew that the time, the, the 70 years prophecy, not 70 weeks, don't confuse them, <laughs> the 70 years prophecy of Jeremiah, where Jeremiah said, you will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. That was over. Now the people of God could go back to their home. That's, this is a good time in history. Two years after Daniel saw that, and, you know, talked about it in Daniel 9, a little over two years later, Daniel's mourning. He's weeping. He's under terrible grief. He won't eat anything sweet at least. Some say it's a partial fast, full fast. Doesn't matter. He's fasting. He's grieving. He's mourning for three whole weeks, 21 days. Why is he so sad? Well, it's very interesting. You learn from Ezra that two years after Cyrus made the decree, that the people of God could go back to their land, rebuild their temple, and so on. Two years after that, they stopped. Israel stopped. They got stirred up. Some of them began going back, lost interest. Some opposition was raised up against them, and they just gave up, and they stopped. And Daniel was weeping. Daniel understood that this decree that Cyrus gave began the 70 weeks prophecy that he had received that same year. And so the question is, why would Daniel be in mourning two years after the joyous decree? Well, in Ezra 3, verse 8, we learn that only two years after Cyrus gave the decree, the Jews had backslidden. And being fearful of men, they ceased to work on the temple. And Daniel was mourning. So that's the, history, that's the background to all of this, okay? All right. But on the 24th day of the first month, when he was on the banks of the river Hedekal, people pronounce it differently. You can just pick your own pronunciation. Hedekal, Hedekal, and so on. But anyway, many believe, and I agree, that this is the Tigris that's spoken of in Genesis, one of the oldest rivers. Well, I guess every river on the earth has been here since God created it, so... Although, although some rivers do get developed over time, but anyway. So it's, uh, this is an old river, the Tigris. He received the vision of Daniel 10, verses 4 through 7. And the revelation that followed it explained everything to Daniel. This vision that comes after, I mean, the prophecy that comes after this vision lays it all out and talks about the period of transition from the third to the fourth kingdom. So it's interesting how this, these prophecies of Daniel develop. At the time of the transition from the first to the second kingdom, you got Daniel 9 and 10. In Daniel 8, remember, he talked about the fact that there would be a transition from the second to the third kingdom, Greece, from Persia to Greece. Well, that's what Daniel chapter 11 is all about. Daniel 11 is about the third kingdom and its transition to the fourth kingdom. So, very organized. One of the most organized books in the Bible. So, in any event, enough of that. Let's go ahead. Overview description of Daniel's vision. We actually looked at it when we read it here a little bit ago. But what we're going to look at now, uh, take a look a little bit more closely and look at the similarities and the differences. So with your finger here at Daniel 10, go over to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. And 
There it is. And beginning at verse number 11, you have the description of Jesus Christ standing in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. When you get a chance, you might want to take Daniel 10, 4 through 7. I think it's where the actual vision is described. And compare what you read there to Revelation chapter 1, uh, beginning at verse number, uh, number 13 uh, through verse 16. Or for, actually, you should take verse 17. And when you compare those, and what I like to do sometimes is take those passages and copy them, paste them, and put, put it here and then here, and then just look back and forth at them and, and analyze them. That's what I've done in preparation for this lesson. And it's just it's interesting to see the similarities and the differences. So, first of all, the vision is very like that or like what John received when he was on the Isle of Patmos. And most agree that the vision that Daniel received at Hittical is a preview of the appearance of the Son of Man on the earth in his glory. So the vision is very like what John saw and experienced on Patmos. And most agree the vision Daniel received at Hittical, or Tigris, is a preview appearance of the Son of Man on earth. Not identical but it's believed by most that it's the same person, although there are some who disagree, and there are some good reasons to disagree. So we're going to look at that uh, in our study here this morning as we proceed. So third, if so, it follows that this prophecy uh, comes after the prophecy of 70 weeks as a, as a way of kind of explaining and fleshing out the whole story of how this comes to pass, that after Christ the Messiah comes, there's a period of time, there's a gap there. And during that gap, there's a transition that goes on. You remember that in Daniel chapter 9, we showed you how the idea that there are stops and starts in the 70 weeks prophecy is revealed in the prophecy itself. It's not an abstract that's just made up to explain some problem. It's in there uh, because the language makes it clear. After three score and two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. So if you're paying attention to the language, it means you come to the end of three score and two weeks, which is when Messiah shows up. And sometime after that, Messiah is cut off. And then confirmation of the covenant with many for one week. Well, at the end of that 62 weeks, it's actually 69. There's seven weeks, 62 weeks, and one week, remember? Remember? So when it talks about at the end of the 62 weeks, in terms of the overall prophecy, we're at the 69th week. You with me? So we're at the 69th week. At the end of it, sometime after that, some things happen. And those things happen. When those things are done happening, then the 70th week begins. And my point there is that there is a break or a gap between the 69th and the 70th week that's in the language of the prophecy. It's not an invention. I say that because a lot of people have trouble with it. They think that it's just sort of, well, it's just made up to solve a problem. It's not. No, it's in the language. If you're listening to what the Bible is saying, it's very clear there is a stop and a start right there. I believe there's also a start and stop in the language after the seven weeks and the three score and two, but we won't go back over that. So anyway, okay, so what happens is Daniel receives this prophecy of the 70 weeks, and now what he's going to do in Daniel's, Daniel chapters 10, 11, and 12 is he's going to give us, fill in a lot of historical detail that covers that period of the gap. All right? Because that prophecy goes all the way up to Messiah the Prince. That's when the Messiah the Prince shows up. Then there's some stuff that goes on from between there and when the 70th week starts. And that's the period, that gap. That's the period that Daniel chapters 10, and 11 and 12 are all about. Amen? <coughs> because when you get to the end of, when you get to 12, you are into those events that are part of the 70th week. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, ta -da, let's finish this up. Is the certain man of Daniel's vision the son of man of John's vision? That's the question. So there are some important similarities. Differences are, in, are as important as similarities. But let's look at the similarities for right now. All right, first, a certain man. Daniel 10, verse number 5. 
A certain man, it agreed, that agrees well with John's notice that his vision was one like unto the Son of Man. Now here's, I should have set it up a little differently than I did in my, in my preparations. But I thought of it after I'd already finished the preparation, so I didn't want to redo it. <laughs> but what I should tell you right now is there are some differences. Now, there are such a thing, or there is such a thing as a difference that makes a difference. And then there is such a thing as a difference that is a difference, but it really doesn't make a difference. <laughs> okay? And this is the kind of difference that is a difference, but doesn't make a difference. And here's what I'm saying. If you, if you refer to this person as a certain man or you refer to this person as the son of man, that's not a difference that makes a difference. If you refer to this person as Gabriel the angel <coughs> and then refer to the other one as the son of man, that's a difference that makes a difference. See what I'm saying? So that's, we're proceeding with that assumption that there are differences. The thing, they're just a little a different way of saying something or a different way of describing something that doesn't make a fundamental difference that requires us to decide these are different people. And then there are some differences, however, that do suggest they might be different people. So let's look at them. A certain man is not one of those differences that make a difference. Clothed in linen, uh, Daniel chapter 10, verse number 5. That's another one of those differences that really doesn't make a difference. Uh, when it says in, Dan in John's vision, he was clothed with a garment down to the foot. Well, that garment could have been linen. You get what I'm saying? So Daniel looked at it, it was linen. John looked at it and said, it's a garment. So there's a difference, but it's not a difference that makes a difference. I, I want to come back, though, and say the differences are interesting. They do communicate different aspects of the same thing that we'll look at another time. But we're, our question is, is there a difference between these two visions that requires us to conclude they're different people? That's the thing we're looking at. The next one is, he's girded about the loins with fine gold of euphaz. So this, uh, this is a difference that's a little bit uh, more of a difference. Because we're told in John's vision that he was girded about the paps with a golden girdle. Here it says he's girded about the loins with fine gold of euphaz. Now, whether the fine gold of Euphaz gives us further insight into the gold that was, uh, that was the, that girded about, that girded about the paths of the Lord Jesus Christ in John's vision is irrelevant. That's not a problem. Our problem is the paps are up here and the loins are down here, around your hips. So this had to be a really, really wide belt. That's a big belt. It can also be However, let me show you why. This is not a difference that like makes a difference. Because, okay, I'm, I'm having a little bit of fun here. First of all, I do believe the Lord probably changes clothes every now and then. <laughs> okay. I imagine in heaven, you know, you don't have the problems we have down here. So maybe it's not as necessary as it is around here. But nevertheless, you see, that's not a difference that makes a difference. It doesn't force us to just, oh, these are different people. There's no way these could be the same people. Now, if he said this, he was wearing a, uh, a belt of calves hide. And then over here, he's wearing a, you know, a, a belt or a girdle of gold. You might, even then, though, you really, it's not a difference that makes a difference. You get what I'm saying. It, there's a distinction here, but it's not the kind of difference that drives us to conclude, no, these must be different people. All right? So there are a lot of explanations for this that I go into in my notes, by the way, that I won't go into here because we're running out of time already. But uh, that's why you want the notes. Amen? Okay. His face is the appearance of lightning. Well, that corresponds very well with John's description of his countenance shining as the sun in its strength. So it's just a matter of description. You know, it, it, it describes something that you, you could describe the same phenomena in either of the uh, phenomenon in either of these ways and it would be fine. The eyes is a lamp of fire. Definitely no problem. Right. <laughs> because in John, he says a lies is a eyes is a lamp of fire. And in Daniel eyes is a lamp of fire. So, you know, and most of us would say it's in the eyes. Right. And you look at some uh, some you got twins. You know, the best way to differentiate between, between twins is look at their eyes. 
That is the best way to do it. Arms and feet like polished brass, no problem. The, the vision he receives in Daniel 10, his arms and his feet are like polished brass. Okay? And John, his feet as brass, as if it's been burned in the furnace. Okay? Not much of a difference there. Not the kind of difference that requires a difference. In fact, a sufficient similarity there to suggest that they're the same. And then the voice is a mighty and constant roar. Daniel using the expression like the voice of a multitude. <laughs> and John using the expression the voice of many waters. Well, again, that's just a different way of describing the same thing. All right? It's not a difference that makes a difference. There's nothing in these differences that would compel us to conclude these are different people. There's enough correspondence in these two descriptions to suggest, as a matter of fact, that they are the same person. But let's look at some more telling differences. The above points of similarity between the two accounts are striking. However, the differences in the two accounts are also important. For example, Daniel describes the body being like burl. Now, burl is a crystalline a gemstone that often is cut like an emerald. So it has facets, and it, it does the, the whole thing with making light go all over the place, that kind of thing. That's, it's unique, particularly in that regard, that it d refracts light and, lets, and makes it go in all kinds of different directions. So the arms and the feet of this certain man are described as appearing like polished brass. How did I get there? Our conclusion anyway. Oh, I know why, because I've got all this stuff about Burl in my notes. I didn't put it in here. Um, let me just put it this way. Burl, there has, there's not some one stone color that is burl. Burl can be, have greenish tones like an emerald. It can have, it can be like topaz. It can have golden thing. It can have a lot of different colors. And so since the body is overall described as being like brass or polished brass, the burl in question here might have been the topaz or the, the amber looking burl, okay? You, you keep, I mean, and again, it's not a difference that makes a difference, in other words. But I think if you read through my notes, you'll see why I conclude that the reference to the burl here is really about how the brass-like shining uh, body appearance is, is, as it were, glistening out of the body in shafts of light going in all different directions. I think that's the picture that we're looking at here, and that's why the burl is mentioned. So all things considered... I believe that, as a matter of fact, the person you're looking at in Daniel 10 is none other than a pre-appearance, a preview of the person we see manifested in John's vision. But there's one very strong argument against it that suddenly gets weak when you read the passage carefully. And I really wanted to get there and spend time there, but I can't. So read my notes, but let's look at the passage. Here's the argument. It said in Daniel, that in Daniel 10, the description, beginning at verse number 5, and running through uh, verse 9, describes the same person being spoken of in verse 10. So when it says, And behold, an hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands, and he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, and he goes on. Now, here's the problem. If that's true, if the person talking to Daniel, after he sees the vision, if the person talking to Daniel is the same person that he just saw in the vision, it's not Christ. Why do we know that? Because I don't think Christ would have to have Michael's help to overcome the prince of Persia. Amen? So that's the strongest argument against concluding that the vision Daniel saw described in verses 5 through 9 is the same vision John received or is the same person that John saw in, John, in Revelation 1. But now look at verse 10. Remember I said verse 10 is the key here. Verse 10 says, And behold, an hand. Indefinite article, and. We use... We wouldn't use the, uh, the article an here. We would use the article a here because we look at the H as a consonant and never mind. <laughs> okay. But that's why it says an hand here. And 
that's indefinite. If it was the person he had just seen, he would have said, as he does consistently, and he touched me. That's what happens in, in the Gospel of John, uh, Gospel of uh, the Gospel, in Revelation chapter 1, when John is describing Jesus Christ, he says, he laid his right hand upon me. He didn't say, a hand came out of nowhere and touched me. Right? He identifies who it was that touched him. Here he does not. So that's a break right there in the narrative. And I think if you just, I can only just take the time now to give you a heads up on that. Now you study it, look at it closely. But it goes to something I've said to you over and over and over again. Read carefully. Read closely. Pay attention. The answer is there. If you look close enough at it, you'll see it. A hand touched me. In every other case, in Daniel, he tells us who it is that touched him. There is no reason for him not to tell us who it was that touched him here. He just said, a hand touched me. If you'll take that little clue and run with it, you'll see it. What happens is he sees this great vision. It overwhelms him, just like it did John. Same reaction, by the way, I didn't go there. In both cases, they reacted to the vision the same way. He just fell over, swooned. All right? But somebody else comes and touches him. And later on, you'll see it. Since you have given, how can I talk to this? Oh, I can't even talk. But you are making me feel okay, right? That's what he does later on. So he says, you've strengthened me. I can, I can talk to you, but I can't talk to him. See, that's what's happened here. So in the New Testament grace, though, the saint can talk to him. That's beautiful, isn't it? The Old Testament saint couldn't talk to him. The New Testament saint is able to talk to him. Pretty awesome, isn't it? Let's stand together, please. So the manifestation of the Lord of glory for Daniel's vision of the evening and the morning is found in Daniel 5, or Daniel 10. And so that's that. Father, thank you so much for our time and your word. Bless us now, Lord Jesus, as we move forward in your study, in the study of your prophecy in Daniel 11. It's an exciting revelation of the amazing accuracy of your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you.